Um, and I did want to say, so this tasting is Ferrari Ferrano holiday wine. And that is what we came here to talk about. And we are really, really excited to talk to you about holiday wines today. Um, you know, candidly, it's been a intense and really tough autumn in Sonoma County and in particular for the Ferrari Prano family. Um, so we don't want to um, leave that as the elephant in the room. We want everybody to know um, that we're here and we do want to talk about what's been going on. Um, but we'd like to do that up front uh, and then move into our tasting and really focus on the celebrations ahead that we are I think really ready for. We're really ready. <laughs> Damn, like, yeah. Spend some time with our family and um, just start enjoying wine and uh, being together. Absolutely. Um, give me just one second. Okay. So, um, you know, to start October 3rd, uh, the founder of Ferrari Carano, Don Carano, passed away. Um, he did pass peacefully and um, while we are all feeling the loss, um, we're just really in awe of the incredible life that Dawn led. And it um, really struck me just what a beautiful legacy he leaves us with to celebrate. And it's true. I mean, if you read his obituary, it's, he's done a lot and he's really just amazing. Everything that he's accomplished in his life and we, you know, got to know him and work with him. I've worked with him for 13 years. And so it's been very, a word that he uses a lot, very special to have had um, him as, you know, as a leader of the winery. And um, he leaves a, a lot for us here at Ferrari Corona to be proud of and to continue to work towards a lot of his goals and dreams were important to us. and. You're, you know, still here and um, excited to work ahead in his honor. Um, Don was in his mid-80s, and um, when you read about everything he accomplished in his life, it seems like he could have been 300 years old. Um, I feel like he lived multiple lifespans in, in one fairly full life. Um, 85 is not young, but uh, I, I feel like he was just you know, so actively involved in Ferrari Carano um, until the end. And he also was um, so important to Reno, Nevada um, as a casino owner and um, as a lawyer. He, again, like it's just when you think about him, he just touched so many lives. And throughout all of his business ventures, there were just stories pouring in through social media and everywhere, which we've been incredibly grateful for. Um, people who met him once, people who were fans of the wine and, and came to an event that he was at, people who worked with him for decades, but decades ago, and still have these really personal memories of him. Um, it's true. I mean, I, I miss him just coming by the winery. He was really involved with the winery, you know, you know up until... <laughs> a month ago, um, and he'd come by, just come by the winery and like be ready to give him a full report of what we were doing at the winery, and you'd do that, and then he would just keep asking, and you're like, so what else is going on? And then I'd figure out, you know, he just wants to talk about personal stuff. Um, I never could really talk sports with him, but um, we talk about food, and um, that's something we have in common, talking about food got some good recipe and, you know, food tips from him over the years. That's awesome. Well, maybe we'll hear about those <laughs> as we get into tasting and talking about the holidays. Yeah. Um, I know Rhonda is also, just as a family, the Coronas love celebration, and that, of course, means holidays are a big feast. Yeah. Um, we are not going to drink our Chardonnay. We're not going to talk about our Chardonnay yet, but I feel like we should pour out a toast. So if everybody wants to get the Sonoma County Chardonnay out, and um, we're going to be just toasting to the incredible life of our founder, Don Carano.
Face to down. Two. Um, God, it feels, and, and this is really what it was like um, for us here. Sorry if we get emotional. Um, it feels like you don't even get to take a breath um, after Dawn's passing and then the fires hit um, for weeks. Uh, Sonoma County, Mendocino County, Napa Lake County, like so much of the North Bay um, was affected uh, personally during that time. Um, one of the things that I think is most important to say is that a lot of people outside of Sonoma County, for instance, don't realize how truly enormous Sonoma County is. Sonoma County is uh, 1.1 million acres. So even though the fires caused um, a lot of damage, a lot of damage um, undeniably, they also, uh, so much of the county is still here. <laughs> when we look out the window of the winery or walk outside, it's beautiful. This is one of the most stunning falls um, I've ever seen. It's, um, a, and it's kind of, I mean, so the winery, or the fire got very, very close to the red wine facility out in Geyserville. We're up on a hill at 1,100 feet elevation, and um, the fires were on the hill that's right behind the, <laughs> the vineyard. So it didn't actually encroach into the vineyards. We had Cal Fire up there. Um, you know, keeping watch and fighting the fires, and so it stayed away. But there are, are actually, you know, are scars up there from the fire. We've got a lot of black, um, scorched, you know, grasses, and then the trees behind are all orange. But it's interesting because we've had a little bit of rain, and it's already, it's already turning green. That is amazing. Yeah, I mean, we still have the scorched trees, but it's already the black is going away. It's already turning green. And so um, that's one of the things I just wanted to upfront um, take this moment to kind of dispel some myths. Um, first of all, I think 8% of the land of Sonoma County was damaged, leaving 92% as beautiful as ever and remaining. And candidly, um, we're open for business and yeah. we really want to see you and you won't have you know, it may be an emotional time, but you will not have a bad time coming here. Um, it's a beautiful place, and seeing the strength of the community right now is um, so heartening. I think this is going to be a really, um, really tightly knit holiday season for a lot of people. Um, and wine is <laughs> so in order. Yes. Um, but I wanted to also just talk, um, dispelling myths, which you can speak better to than me, about um, the vineyards themselves. So I was interested in how the vineyards actually largely were unaffected and caused a um, barrier to the fire's spread. In some yeah, ways they were protecting, that's right? That's true. I mean, we have a lot of vineyards um, all around the county, and um, none of the vineyards were harmed in any way. And there won't be any lasting effects from the fires. Um, all the leaves are going to drop off, the vines are going to be dormant, and then we'll start over again next year. So um, most of the grapes were picked. Yeah, most of the grapes were picked. All of the white grapes were picked. I mean, they were done down at the estate winery. We still had some yet to pick. Um, so I think throughout the county, the stat was like 90% yeah. of the grapes were picked before um, the fire started, which in a way, the fact that we had a big heat wave in early September yeah. ended up being a little bit of a blessing yeah. for those grapes. If there had been a really um, tough, volatile September, October, the grapes might not have been picked because they might yeah. not have been ripe. Yeah, but we were fortunate for that weather. I mean, we had a lot of um, grapes that were already ripe, and we had already picked, picked a lot, so it's a good thing. We definitely find, find our silver lining. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as we get into tasting these wines, I definitely want us to be able to um, talk about, uh, none of these are, of course, are going to be the 2017 vintage, but talking about um, the three vintages that are represented in our tasting today and then kind of how they compared to this 
bizarre year. <laughs> 2017 is still going to yield really nice oh, wines. Oh, yeah. Um, but I tasted so many oh, good wines from 17 already. So yeah. Because some of that was great. Um, but it was such a different year from these drought years that are represented here in some case, um, in some cases. So it'll be interesting to get into that. Um, in case any of you don't know, the last thing that I think we should say about the fires is just that um, all of Ferrari Corona's vineyards remain. Um, they were not harmed in the fire. And uh, Rebecca did mention that there were you know, trees very near to the Alexander Wine facility. Um, the hotel vineyards in that the Corona's own town in Santa Rosa was extremely near to the fire and um, had to close for a little bit because of gas mains. But the actual properties were undamaged. That's a property that's surrounded by a 92-acre vineyard that the Corona zone. Um, and throughout um, the three counties where Ferrari Corona has wines, um, we were incredibly lucky not to suffer any losses. That's true. Lucky, but again, um, when the fire happened, um, even though the grapes were almost entirely picked, they were um, still uh, green enough vegetation uh, to be somewhat of a fire retardant, right? Yeah, and yeah. irrigation, I think, came into play as well. Yeah, and there was some property that really helped um, stop spreading the fires uh, in, in different areas, but nowhere around where we were. Awesome. Well, um, we've got Shard in our glass already uh, from toasting to Dawn. I feel like... Um, just being here today and at this beautiful property um, with people, um, you know, fans around the country tasting with us calls for another toast. Um, <laughs> so let's do that and then let's get to talking about this Sonoma County Chardonnay. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, honestly, so much for being here with us. So, um, this, we decided on um, the first wine in the tasting being uh, the entry level from our classic series, the uh, Sonoma County Chardonnay, um, which is one of the, it's our most affordable Chardonnay um, and easy to find throughout the United States. Um, I love this wine. Why did this wine feel like the right one to start off our holiday tasting? I think, I mean, mainly because it's so versatile in its use. I mean, you can use it just drinking right now. Cheers, toasty. Mm -hmm. um, but also, we have this Thanksgiving menu that's coming up, and I mean, this wine can go wonderfully with any kind of anything that's on the table, practically. You know, your turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy, stuffing. Um, it's, this is going to be a nice wine to pair with your Thanksgiving meal. You can just go any, any of any of it, basically, unless you have something strange you have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it's a nice one. We're hearing some nice comments already. Um, Randy Fuller said that it has a beautiful nose um, with citrus, lanolin, I love that note, um, stone fruit, and he says the earthy elements play very well. Um, and I, I think I failed to mention that Amy Lieberfarb of Sonoma Chat is here with us. Um, we, not on the ground, um, though she is presumably nearby. Um, we love having um, some of our uh, favorite local fans participate as well. So Amy wanted to ask um, what made Ferrari Corona decide to use screw caps on some of the wine. It's like, it's, you know, there's zero cork tank for, I guess that would be the main reason why, but it's also for these um, fresh, fruity wines. I mean, it is such a you know, easy closer to use. It's going to preserve the freshness of the wine. And, and I, I don't know, I love the screw cap. You don't need a corkscrew. You just open it. And if you want to only have one glass, just have a glass, put the screw cap back on and stick it back in the fridge. So it's a really convenient closure to use and it preserves the quality of the wine. And particularly appropriate for wines that don't require anything. Right. Um, I love this wine. I feel like this wine makes a great um, wine to take to a party. Yes. And I love being able to take a scoop cap wine to a party. I don't know if you have this experience, but um, <laughs> I don't know where our wine key went, but 
I am very attached to the particular style of wine key. They aren't expensive, but like the pull tap style that you get when you work in a restaurant, because that's where I first started working with wine. Uh -huh. And so whether I go over and someone has like the arm oh, shape one, yeah. or if they have like a fancy thing, like a rabbit that does it all for you, I feel the same way that I feel as an Android user when someone hands me an iPhone. Okay. <laughs> so screw cap is amazing because I don't have to seem pretentious bringing my own <laughs> cork through with me. And I don't have to feel um, like I like I look in that to try to use somebody else's opener. <laughs> That's another good point. I haven't thought of that. But. I don't know if you have that experience, but I, I'm not, uh, I don't translate well to other technologies. So um, it's also like, I mean, with this Chardonnay, I think it's actually kind of neat that we are starting out with this wine because, you know, with Inception for Icrano in um, 1985 was, we started Chardonnay back then. So, I mean, I think it's kind of neat, and um, this particular Chardonnay contains, um, one of the vineyards is the home ranch, so it's the first vineyard that the Coronas purchased. When they came to Sonoma County looking for vineyards to purchase, they um, purchased the home ranch, 60 acres of Chardonnay, and that's what they started out with. So, I think it's kind of neat that you, I mean, you chose this one to get started with. I think it's a perfect choice for that reason, too. It really does um, celebrate the brand at the most sort of accessible level, again, being a wine that you can find anywhere. And just to look, like, I get emotional when I'm somewhere really far away and I see these Ferrari Corona wines that I do know so intimately the history of and that do go back. 85 is my birth year. Like, it's oh. as old as me. <laughs> okay. Um, the winery, so it's it's pretty special. Um, we have uh, Swaff says that he is drinking this barely below 60 and just signing on, and he calls this a little grassy beauty of the fab aromas. Um, and then George Perry said uh, that it has hints of acid on the back palate and that it's refreshing. Um, I, yeah, uh, I love the Chardonnays. I, always just rave about the Chardonnays at Ferrari Corona, but I love just that they do have um, a voluptuousness about them, but they also have such good acidity, which is, for me, what makes them an awesome food wine. Food wine, yeah. And the oak is not overpowering. It's only, you know, around 23% new oak, French oak, and I think that, you know, it lets the fruit come, you know, show through the wine, and so having a fruity wine with nice acidity goes great. Terry Sullivan wanted to know on that note, how do you determine how much new oak versus old oak you're going to put on one of your wines? Well, with uh, reserve wines, is, you know, where you start adding a little bit more oak, and those are usually vineyards that are, you know, you select a reserve vineyard. It's going to be some, something that's yielding uh, grapes that have more concentration and depth to them. So when you have grapes that are more have more concentration to it, then you can layer on a little bit more oak to them without covering up the fruit. So that's, that's how I look at it. And you know, there's different types of oak that you can use too, because, because some types of oak can be heavier, you know, just this from this barrel that's cooper and this toastiness versus another cooper. Um, people make the barrels, one barrel can be more toasty and stronger than another barrel. Too. So you also have to take that into consideration when you're applying oak to wine. Cool. I'm excited to hear us talk about how that kind of plays into threads that you work on. Um, I feel like we, since we did have a lot to talk about up front, um, I don't want to speed us through our tasting, but I feel like it's time for us to taste our Pinot Noir. So I'm going to um, suggest that we pour that into our glasses. It's always a little bit of a musical chairs, musical glasses, I should say. So uh, we are tasting the next in our lineup is the uh, 2014 Ferrari Crono Anders uh, Anderson Valley Pinot Noir. Um, I really like about this lineup. Um, that we're we're dealing with um, 
we have like a single vineyard wine expression in our El Dorado Noir um, from Russian River Valley. And then we have two wines with the Tresor and the Chardonnay showcasing multiple vineyard sites in Sonoma County. And we have our Mendocino County um, Anderson Valley wine. So we're getting kind of a, a big slice of what Ferrari Corona does. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And we have a blend and we also have um, varietal specific wines. Mm -hmm. So again, just a nice broad spread like you would see on a holiday table. <laughs> like you might, uh, you in particular tasting these wines, uh, be able to have on your own holiday table, I guess, if you, well, if you went out and got them again, they probably aren't going to last the week. <laughs> We're still a little ways out. Um, getting close. I can't believe though, I, when I think about Thanksgiving next week and then I'm like, oh my God, it's the end of the year and then there's going to be another year. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Time goes so fast and it doesn't stop. Um, also, uh, gosh, I can't remember who asked us, but somebody asked us, I think it was Tom, um, which glasses to use. And I think these Riedels are exactly the glasses that you have at home with that little bowed lip. I think these are technically called organ, like the New World Pinot Noir glass. Oh, I don't know. They were made, I think, originally for organ Pinot. Um, but he was saying he had burgundy glasses from Riedel and organ glasses. Yeah, and I, I think I have the same ones at home, but I they're like their Pinot glasses. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Riedel makes different ones. And so these are like the New World Pinot glasses, oh, okay. I believe. And it has the little tulip top. Um, oh my god. <laughs> I always think I don't want to stop drinking the Chardonnay until I start drinking the Pinot. So um, tell us a little about this 2014. Well, this is. Um, so our Pinot Noirs, all of our Pinot Noirs are made out at Lee's Creek Winery in Philo in Anderson Valley. And this particular Pinot is a blend of three different ranches. So we have three different sites that are coming together to like, you know, add different layers of flavors. Um, two of the vineyards are up at elevation. So our Sky High Ranch is up at about 1100 feet elevation. So when you go out there, you're surrounded by conifer trees and it gets the fog and um, nice cold breezes in the afternoon. It kind of has the flavor of a wild plum out there. We have another ranch that's up above um, Boonville. It's called Middle Ridge and that's at about, I think it's around 1000 feet. I'm going backwards. It's 1,100 feet elevation in Middle Ridge and about 1,600 feet elevation at Sky High. I think I got this backwards. But anyway, it gives you like these raspberry and acai type of flavors. And then at the heart of everything, we have Lazy Creek vineyards that give um, cherry, nice acidity, and mineral quality. So you have all of those three vineyards that you can put together into you know one bottle, and it's just a classic Pinot Noir that we're getting from that blend. Um, George says that he loves the reddish purple color on this wine. Beautiful. And I do too. It just, I love um, Anderson Valley Pinot Noir when it's, you know, not too young, but young, like freshly released, um, just is like a mouthful of fresh fruit. It's, I don't know, it's all like it's so perfumed, it's so bright, and I feel like this color just looks so ruby, like so rich. This is pretty. I mean, you get the, the floral rose petals. Yeah, so it's pretty start to finish. Um, Tom says, What do you think is the optimal age to enjoy this wine and um, its longevity? Well, I would say, I mean, this is ready right now. I would take this bottle to Thanksgiving dinner with the Chardonnay. And, you know, give it another, I think it's five years, be good. I, but I'm not, I like to drink my wines young. I like them more fresh and fruity, mm -hmm. especially with the Pinot Noir, I enjoy the fruit format. But the acidity is good enough, so it depends on how you like the wines. If you like them a little bit more aged, you can hang on into it, maybe 10 years. But I go about maybe five years. Amy says that the Pinot would pair well with most foods, even spicy dishes, um, that it is very for fruit forward. And um, she's got a picture of what looks like nachos, which I can totally see. I would, I would, we were just saying we were hungry, which is the wrong state to be in when you started tasting, but it is the right state to be in. Um, 
when you're actually tasting with the restaurant, when, you, when you're not obligated to sit here and talk about it first. Um, we were like, man, why, do, why are we hungry now when we have an hour to go? Um, but I would love some nachos. If you want to come, if you want to just come down to the winery, come on camera, bring the nachos. Um, anyway. Well, if you're not having turkey or nachos, you can also stick those, you know, have those with um, a rack of lamb. It's another nice holiday um, food preparation that would be probably with the peanuts. I had lamb last night, and I would agree. George was just saying that uh, he loves the dry finish and wants uh, juicy red meat for this. Okay. Um, and then Swaf asked, um, and I know the answer is the yes, but you can talk a little about Christy if you want. Uh, Swaf is asking, does the Lazy Creek winemaker make this Pinot Noir. Yes, yes, Christy Ackerman, she's um, out there at, in, by the way, Lazy Creek, and she makes makes all the Pinot Noir out there. We make a rosé of Pinot Noir and a Gold Sonier as well. What I think is amazing about um, just the, the way that Ferrari Prano has this um, just really incredibly high quality hands-on approach and yet is fairly large and can do a lot of different grape varieties is what you end up with is the capacity to have a facility that is devoted to red wines um, up in Alexander Valley where you're making wines at the mountain facility. Um, and that facility existed before Ferrari Carano was making Pinot Noir. So when they bought Lazy Creek um, for the wines that have the Lazy Creek label, it also, um, you know, they renovated this production facility to make it a state-of-the-art facility specifically designed to do Pinot Noir. And where we are here today in Dry Creek Valley is where the whites are made. And the equipment is different when you're making white wines. Yeah. The process is different when you're making a Cabernet or a Bordeaux blend from when you're making Pinot Noir. Yeah. Um, if you have questions about that, Rebecca can answer all of those questions because she's worked with all of these varieties um, and all of these different types of winemaking. Um, but it's so neat to just have these um, state-of-the-art facilities where they're always looking toward making them um, efficient, sustainable, and and mainly just uh, primed to do an excellent job of a focused task. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like having all these three different facilities we can really focus in on the varieties that we're working with. And um, the Red Wine Winery <laughs> was designed specifically for making red wine. Um, so what is that? What's an example of how that how that looks? I guess visually, or well, tell me a little bit about your, that facility. Just like well, I mean it's a very uniquely designed winery. There's not really a lot like it. We have a, a delivery system where we can um, deliver the grapes in the tanks by gravity. So it can all be gravity fed. We can do as much sorting as we want to with conveyors that take all the wine and the grapes into the tanks. And then all the tanks are designed for fermenting red wine. Because you know, the grapes go into the tank and the fermentation is happening with the grapes in the tank with the skins to get all the color. And it's designed with um, full jackets. On, on the tanks, so to keep it cool during fermentation or not let it get too hot. You might do cold fermentation, but we don't want it, don't want it to get too hot. So we have um, warming and he um, heating capability and, and chilling capability, and it's just designed to make you Awesome. That's, I love learning this. Um, so I've used a word I haven't even heard. Uh, he says, the dirty power edge of Anderson is visible. Uh, carborundum and mud. I don't know what carborundum even is. Do you? Maybe it's like the forest floor. Um, I think that you should define that for us. <laughs> um, I, I want to know. I, I mean, I can guess, but I am really interested and I love learning new notes like this. Um, Mary is here with us. Um, here but in Oregon, uh, and says that uh, she thinks that Pinot Noir is one of the most versatile reds to pair, um, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, you forget, you can use all sorts of fish, you can have with salmon. Oh it's yeah. Delicious with grilled salmon. It's got such a nice body, um, like a medium body profile being, I think of this as somewhat bigger among Pinot Noirs, because some Pinot Noirs can be super light, but I think this one is a nice, like, 
medium bodied wine that does make it so it has a nice like silky oh. texture to it it's silky but then on the same instance it has the acid mm -hmm. to keep it bright um and uh swaff says like the shard uh the shard doesn't have massive tannins i'm confused <laughs> <laughs> massive tannins for a pinot bitter and grasping the finish um I, all right. I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, so, uh, do you know the production level for the Pinot here? It's very small. I'm not, not sure. <laughs> what was it? 2012 was the first vintage, is that right? Of the Anderson Valley? Of Pinot Noir for Ferrari Corona. No, oh, no, no. It goes back, I think it was 2006. Oh, okay. I didn't, I thought that maybe it's Because we were making Pinot Noir before we even purchased the Lazy Creek. Okay, so I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah, so Lazy Creek was purchased in 2008. And um, and then we, before that, we had the Sky High Ranch, and so we were making that. But even before that, we were making some uh, Russian River Pinot Noir as well. Um, okay, cool. I, Learn something new every day. We've been making Pinot Noir for a little while, just, you know, little bits, little small, uh, small production amounts. But. Yeah, so this, when you taste this wine, this is one that's, this is the highest production among our Pinot. Uh, yeah, so we do have, you know, out at um, Lazy Creek, they have some single vineyard production that are much smaller. So they do bottle up each of the vineyards I was talking about, the Sky High, Middle Ridge, in Lazy Creek, they each have their own smaller, very select production of single vineyards. Right. And then, um, we, and then we have the blend too. So. Nice. Um, so, on that note, I feel like we should move into our tracer. Yes. Um, switching gears completely for a red. I think this is um, such a different and um, if you thought that the Pinot Noir was powerful for a Pinot, the Tresor is quite a bold wine. So, can you talk about the history of Tresor? Uh, well, I think we did. History. We did uh, at first was called a Reserve Red, the first vintage that they came out with before they developed the package and called it Tresor. So. And, you know, I'm, I wasn't here back then, so I don't know how that happened. But um, this bottle of wine, I have to say, is my favorite to take as a gift when I'm going to, you know, someone's house for dinner. If I'm invited over, I like to take something nice. And the is one of my favorites just because of the package. is not only just because of the package. I mean, it's a beautiful wine, but the package is, is lovely as well. And um, it's based on, so it's a, a painting that sits above Tom's desk or behind his desk in his office and so that's a copy of the painting and it was commissioned by Don Rhonda from an Italian painter that lived in California for some time and his name is Marco Sassoni and um, it's I only learned just recently that it's a painting is of the Laguna Beach, and it's the Laguna Hotel, is what I was told, because the artist had spent some time there, and it's a, it's a sunset. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful package to give us a gift. It is. I, I agree with that completely. I think that um, the wine inside is <laughs> um, beautiful and, and perfect if you want to um, open it at a dinner where you're bringing it as a gift, or where you are giving it as a gift, but expecting that somebody is going to open it up in winter, like you're giving it up Christmas time or whatever. I think it is um, a great wine to drink during the winter months. Yes. Um, but it also just looks like um, looks like a gift. It looks like the serious wine inside um, and something that you don't open up on any old Tuesday unless we send it to you and tell you to open it up with us. No, maybe when you're cooking, you know, cooking up that prime <laughs> rib for, you know, a holiday dinner, I think maybe this would be what to pair with your prime rib dinner. Absolutely. Um, 
to go back to the Pinot for a moment, I was also just loving looking at, I mean, this is very uh, varietally correct, but just looking at the opacity on the Tresor, which has these bold, thick-skinned Bordeaux grapes versus um, how translucent the Pinot Noir is, is striking. Um, it's just this inky, rich wine. Um, and then Kathy Sullivan said uh, that she feels like everything from salmon to fowl to beef bourguignon um, to rack of lamb are all beautiful with the Pinot Noir. I, I agree. Good. It's that whole yeah, spectrum. Of me. I know. I know. This is Burn. kind of this is kind of masochistic having to talk about food this whole time. We're gonna love dinner so much. Yes. Um, and then Amy says that the Tresor, uh, she is currently cooking up Brussels sprouts uh, and adding bacon. And then it's gonna be a perfect time. Oh, bacon! Yeah, the inclusion of bacon that would definitely. Yeah, it's it's nice to get um, a winter veggie where you can add that rich, fatty meat to it. Mm -hmm. and the smoky flavor I think will go really nice with this. So when um, was 2013 released? Is that new? Yes. Um, so that, you know, this is a wine that gets much more time in the bottle aging because it is, I mean, the majority of it's cab. So we're starting with a foundation of cab. It is a you know, longer or bigger tannic aging type of wine. And um, in the blend, we uh, blend in all, you know, all the classic pine varieties, Bordeaux varieties. So it has Malbec, Cap Franc, Petit Bordeaux, and Merlot. And and that's a really fun blend to make because we get to work with all these different varieties and each adds its own uh, flavors and textures to the wine. I mean, we know what Cab does. You get the, you know, Cassis type of aroma flavors and, um, leather and tobacco as the cab ages and the structure, but then you get to kind of mellow it out by adding a little bit of Merlot, which is you know, cherry and plum that you get with Merlot and, and the kind of soft um, tannins that help make the tracer a little bit more elegant. Malbec has, you know, inky, beautiful color to it and um, again, some plum character. Petit Verdot and Cab Franc, those, you know, just still add another layer. The Cab Franc can, and both the Petit Verdot and Cab Franc can give like a little bit of a floral quality to the wine. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes you get the raspberry character, blueberries from all these different varieties. And, you know, you put it together into this blend and you create a wine that's elegant but it does have this structure to it so you can you know, age it in the bottle longer and then also you know, drink it 10 years from now. Yeah, um, Terry Sullivan said that it could age for decades and called it a lovely Bordeaux blend, a treasure of dark fruits and spice. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I feel like but Maybe I'm wrong. Nine percent of Petit Verdot seems like kind of a high percentage to see on a Bordeaux blend. Is that true? Is that normal for this blend, or how much does we vary? I think it goes back and forth year to year. Um, with that, I mean, we kind of stick with the standard about seventy percent cab, and then you know, and then it kind of just makes it just depends on how how each ranch is tasting. You know, each in your block is tasting. Because we have a few different blocks that we're choosing from. So, a petit verdot or a, yeah, all of the yeah. Years. We have um, four different blocks of petit verdot that's growing. The Cap Franc, we only have two and they're so cute. Um, one of them's under an acre and one of them's just over an acre. They're on two different ranches. So, one is out at the, in um, actually Knights Valley, up at about 900 feet elevation. And so we've got some different soil types out there. And then our other Cab Franc is also at about 900 feet elevation at our Rock Rise Ranch. So, and, you know, where the winery sits actually, where the other Cab Franc is grown. So we have two different Cab Francs we can choose from to put in the blend. So we are just kind of picking what we think most traits are like, you know, what's going to give it nice structure and good dark fruits. and but, you know, keep it so it's it's elegant. Mm -hmm. 
That makes sense. Um, my vine spot, Dazelle says, a little petit verdot goes a long way. Perhaps that's where this wine gets its lovely deep color. The color, yeah, petit verdot. I mean, all of our wines have pretty good color. Like, but it is, it's one of the inky ones, yeah. right? Well, Malbec gives it, probably has, is the most inkiest of all of them. And the cab itself, or cab, we have fantastic colors in our cab. Because we're growing, all of our cabs grown at elevation. I was just going to ask what the yeah. elevation was. Yeah. So, um, all, all of the cabs grow at elevation and it has, I mean, we have beautiful color coming out of our wines. So the Petit Verdot, I think, you know, it's kind of signature trait, you know, I want to compare it with all the other four varieties, it has the most acid. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so that's the one that can give you, you know, if you need that kind of little bit of acid salt to your wine, you can just on a little bit of Petit Verdot. So, um... Swaff says that he likes the layer of pepper on this wine, and I'm hearing a lot of comments about how good these wines would be with ribs. Um, pepper from <laughs> Cap Front, sometimes you get a little pepperiness in the Cap Front. Nice. Yeah, I get, I love the, um, just kind of that earth and like steeped tea, like steeped oh, black yeah. tea kind of, which I always associate with Cap Franc. Um, Terry wants to know, uh, how many years? Do you know how many years Tresor has been produced? I want to say, was it 91 that it started? Okay. It was, it was after the whites, but it was the first red, right? Or no, Sienna was the first so red. So it was 1989 was the reserve red. And then it went to Tresor after that. So it might have been 1990. Okay. Um, but it's been <laughs> 25 plus years yeah. at this point. Um, and then Amy wanted to know, um, she says if she wanted to purchase these wines for holiday gifts, um, can they be shipped directly to the recipient if they're ordered online? So um, as long as you live in one of the states, there are a few states that don't let us ship, but as long as the recipient is in one of the states, yes, you can order wines um, direct from the winery, from the website, um, and they don't have to be shipped to you. They can be shipped to um, someone as long as they can sign for it and be over 21, of course. Um, and that is a nice note. I appreciate that question, Amy, because there are, um, you can go into a store and you can definitely find the Chardonnay um, pretty easily in any state and to some extent internationally. And Tresor is also one of the ones that you can find all over. Um, you see it in restaurants a lot, but it is, it is available. Um, Pinot Noir to a lesser extent because it is small production, but it is part of our classic series. Um, the dessert wine you can find, but not not as easily, right? It's sometimes you know it'll be in restaurants here and there. I have never seen it on a store shelf, but in lots of them. Eighty-eight, we are told, was the first year of production for eighty-eight <laughs> for the Tresor. So it goes way back. It's almost as old as me too. Um, I want to move into our last wine um, because I know we are going to want to talk a little bit about holidays. Um, Randy, I will say, says um, that uh, it's a cab-heavy blend of five Bordeaux grapes, and he says it has big flavor, a little more new oak, um, is used to uh, let it age well, as we talked about, and called it a treasure, which I think uh, it lends itself to being called that, since it literally means that, but uh, it is. It just, it's a bold name, and I think it lives up to it. Um, but I want to give us ample time to talk about this last wine, because it is extremely unusual. Um, there are only a couple producers that work with this grape variety, right? Yeah, there's not a lot out there. So we call this El Dorado Noir, um, El Dorado taking its name, to go back to Tom for just a moment of um, their first property, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is still, it still exists in Reno and uh, was um, not to be punny, but was a gamble that he took. Um, <laughs> when he opened it, he was told it wasn't a good idea um, to open a casino resort that big. And um, he focused on food and wine, which is actually what led Rhonda and Don to Sonoma County, where they fell in love with wine country and started where we are today, um, Ferrari Carano. Um, but this is El Dorado Noir, and this is 
What grape is this? It's, a, it's made from black muscat grapes that we actually have this planted in our Story Creek vineyard in Russian River Valley. We have like just a little under an acre, just a few rows of these grapes and pear or something else. They're actually, I mean, you think, oh, we need like little tiny grapes to have intense flavors and aromas, which, you know, is the case usually with the, the cab. And they're like tiny berries and little clusters, but these are actually big clusters. So the black muscat clusters can get pretty big, some good sized berries on them too, but they are so intense with their um, aroma. So it's just like rose petals, I mean, just super floral, and you get these rose petals and um, <laughs> Here, I'll just smell it. <laughs> it's your tongue. It smells like rose petals. <laughs> it does. But then, um, I mean, you also get some other aromas out of it, like black raspberry, um, blueberry jam, and, um, and then it has, a, you know, it gets a little bit of caramel notes from the sweetness of it. So it's, I mean. Tweet us if you've never had a black <laughs> muscat before today, um, whether you like it or not, because I do think, I love this one, but I do think it's a polarizing flavor. You have to like those floral. But everyone aromas. knows it was a dessert wine, right, before we got started. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so this shocker. is a smaller bottle because um, you would never need to pour um, the standard five or six ounce glass. You would pour it as like a three ounce glass. So in theory, you would need the half bottle for the same size group, you were pouring a full bottle of a non-sweet wine. And we have this little tulip dessert wine glass for these. Um, so I would love to hear from you guys, whether this is your first time or if you're an expert with black muscat. Um, I learned uh, that, and I might have said this on another tasting, but a lot of wines that we call aromatic, um, I mean, a lot of grapes we call aromatic are technically semi-aromatic grapes and that the definition of an aromatic grape, of course wines give off aromas, but the definition of an aromatic grape is one where you can actually smell the aromas like through the skins, like in the vineyard you smell the grape um, without having to like open it. Um, I've never tried to smell the grape. I mean, I walk through the vineyard and I just like pop it in my mouth. And muscat is there. one of the ones that you can walk into the vineyard and Gewurztraminer is another. There's only like four grape varieties that are actually truly aromatic where the skins themselves, like this, the odor permeates the skins and you can smell without smell. actually like opening it. Yeah. And muscat is one of those. So it makes sense when you describe these big berries. You can actually buy, not black muscat, but you can buy um, they're one of the only grape varieties. Um, I think they're usually called Moscato there, um, but they're one of the only grapes, um, like one of the Musca varieties uh, you can um, like find also for eating at the grocery store. Oh. Almost all wines that you taste as table grapes aren't wines that you would ever see in the grocery store, but sometimes if you're lucky, you can find just Muscat grapes and they are huge. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different muscats though, right? Like this family of grapes have a lot. Yeah, there are. Yeah. I mean, even at the, the Story Creek Ranch, we have um, muscat canali and a muscat shio planted there. So, I mean, we've done various things with it, but nothing, you know, singly with it recently. This is such a cool wine. Do you know how long this has been made? And do you make this? Yes, this is okay. made up at the Red Wine Winery. <laughs> and, um, Red grapes, <laughs> so it comes up there. And how long have we been making this? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> but the whole time I've been working here, we've been making it. So we've made it off and on. We, when I first started working at the estate winery, we made it there. So I was working with them because they didn't transition all the red wines up to the red wine. Um, Winery once it was built. So I started in 2004. So that was the first vintage of at in Geyserville. And so we had still had the Merlot and the Sienna and this El Dorado Noir that we were making at the state winery. And then eventually all the grapes went, all the red ones went up to the to the, the mountain winery. Awesome. Um, tell me about Pairing this wine, it's so unusual. What, um, tell me specifically what on like a Thanksgiving or a Christmas table, what, what well, desserts I mean, go every on? Every time, so we do wine maker dinners and it's 
practically always paired with chocolate. I mean, classically, the chocolate goes great with it. But it's, you don't have to just have it with chocolate. I mean, it's got this lovely fruit and floral that can go, like, it can go with pumpkin pie. The taste? No doubt. Pumpkin pie, or, you know, if you want to make a persimmon pudding, be delicious with it. And uh, pecan pie. Mm -hmm. Another one. Tasty. I always want to go toward fruit things when I see a sweet red wine, but actually I think you're right that these kind of spiced desserts that are less fruit forward are so nice with it. I get kind of like orange oil at the end. Like the, the finish for me is like, um, yeah, like the skin of an orange, but the, the oil of it. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, Terry Sullivan said orange blossoms come to the forefront, which I think it's I just... It does just blossom. Um, Good Wine Guru says um, a tart dessert would help balance this. So the last time I had this was at a winemaker dinner here, and um, there was definitely like a dark chocolate pot of creme or something at the end. It was, it was like it had a nice bitterness to it, mm -hmm. which was great. Um, oh, good. Wine Julia said this is her first time with Black Pascat, and she loves it. Um, and... Drink Hacker, Christopher, said that he's had it before, but he's hardly an expert. <laughs> I think it would be, I would be fascinated to know the person who has tasted a lot of this grape variety. Um, oh, I love that. Terry says, pair with a rocking chair in front of the fire. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good end of the evening, like, conversation line for sure. You don't. You don't necessarily need a wine uh, or a food to pair with something that's sweet. That's true. <laughs> it's good, just as its I mean, own dessert. Sometimes I skip dessert and I finish with, you know, a bottle of cat or something. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and then Good Wine Guru also said um, that this would make an amazing sauce if you reduced it to pour over pancake. Oh, wow. Yeah. I could see that. I would, I would have trouble giving it up, but um, giving it up to a sauce, but it would be amazing. And then okay. there's really nothing more perfect to pair with a food or to pair with a food than the wine that you used in your cooking, right? Yeah. So it would be beautiful if you used it in a dessert and then drink it alongside. Um, we have just five minutes to go. So if you have any last questions for Rebecca, um, please let us know right now. Um, and <laughs> I don't mean right now, right now, but yes, get your last questions in. Um, and uh, I want to know what are you doing for Thanksgiving? And Going home to my family, so um, my husband, both of our families are up in Humboldt County, and so I'm looking forward to visiting them. Nice. Yeah. Did I know that? Did I know that you're from Humboldt? I don't know. I have yeah. a lot of friends in that area. Do you? It's beautiful. I, the Lost Coast is one of my favorite places in the world. Yeah. Um, where are they? What yeah. city? Or town? In Oldestine and Ferndale. Okay. So my parents are in Fortuna. I grew up in Scotia, a little um, lumber mill town, so... I don't feel like Humboldt is super, at least not the towns, they're certainly not like super well known outside of California or even within, like it's so far north. People think of San Francisco as NorCal, but um, it takes 12 hours to get from like LA into Humboldt County um, and it only takes like six or seven to get to San Francisco. So from here you're like still, you still have to go another like three hours north, right? It's three hours, yeah. Yeah. Three hours from north, so. And it's only like, at the top end, it's only like an hour from the Oregon border. Not really any traffic either. It's just lots of trees on the drive up. Um, oh, I love this. Um, Swap says that this is a really fun wine with dry brilliance that enters. Um, so, finally, to close us out, uh, we would like to know what uh, your favorite wines are for the holidays. What are you, I mean, we've got these, and these, I think, are your favorite representations this year, but what's what's on your mind for this holiday or well, your go-tos all the time? I mean, time? I have to admit, we're actually eating out right now at dinner. Yeah. Which, like, you think about how challenges of harvest and wanting to relax, I think it's a great idea. So we're going out to dinner at a little restaurant awesome. in Ferndale, and we happen to carry our fur at front of Oh, I love so it. So we will definitely be having a bottle of that. That is one of my all-time favorite um, Merlots. It's so good, and it's like, I don't know, just always over-delivered. It's such a good value. I love that wine. Yeah, it's so velvety. I'll, I'll take some other wines up there, too. My, um, 
you know, plenty of referring this because my uh, sister in law loves the program. So, you know, he kind of showed me. So, we'll pass on that. And I'd have to take Chase Ward with me, too. So, um, off the top of your head, like one dish each for each of these. What's it going to be? We kind of just talked about other I don't know why, but these three. One dish each? Yeah. Okay. Let's go with. I don't know why I'm not stuffing on the ground. I'm not stuffing on the Chardonnay. Um, the Pinot, does this have to be all turkey? I mean, it can be. Or chicken no, for the no. Thanksgiving? Because I really like I really like the Pinot with my lamb chops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Trey Sewer is going to be with a prime rib for sure, but that'll be, you know, later um, Christmas Eve type dinner. Um, I think my husband's already planning that one. And um, Delicious. And that all the not in the war, we will probably go with some vanilla ice cream. Or I love pecan pie too. So. Pecan pie is so good. I can only. I I, I yeah. have the pecan pie, the ice cream, and the. Yeah, no, please do. <laughs> I, I can eat a lot of food, but for some reason, pecan pie is something that I can, like, like I'm never this person, but I can only take a bite and it's too rich for me after that. <laughs> we'll have the ice cream. It, it counterbalance. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, we will, if you asked questions that we didn't get to in our tasting, we will address them later um, over email with you guys. So feel free if there's something that's just uh, burning in you to ask us. Um, also, if you have as much wine left as we do, you'll probably be sipping these over the next uh, couple days and hopefully sharing them with friends. Um, maybe trying them out if you're trying recipes out for your Thanksgiving meal next week. Um, so if questions come up as you continue to taste these wines, uh, definitely shoot them our way. We will continue to answer them. And um, we hope you have an incredible holiday season. Um, and just uh, hold those near and dear to you close and enjoy some beautiful food and some phenomenal wines. Um, these are definitely going to be uh, inspiring some recipes for me. And Rebecca... I hope you get an incredible amount of rest. Uh, it is so deserved at the end of any harvest season, but one like this. Um, I hope you just get to kind of relax, uh, go out to eat, have no dishes, and hit the reset button um, for what should be a gorgeous year, especially with the rain that's going. Thank you, Chelsea. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.